Have you checked the Hey everyone, welcome back to the Horror Show. I'm Cecil Laird. And I'm in Fuego, y'all. And we are here to complete the final list, uh, final end of the year list, which uh, is a little bit late, but we are going to be talking about our top 10 most anticipated horror movies of 2023. And let the caveat be known that this is as of today, July, or July, June 11th, that we think January. that all... Oh, Jesus Christ. January 11th that we think that all of these are going to be coming out this year. So as of now, the information we have, we believe these are going to be coming out this year. Uh, we don't know, obviously, if it's going to be pushed. We can't uh, can't foresee that. But this is as of today. Right, Fuego? Yep, exactly. And hmm. honestly, mine are in no particular order, really. If, if, now, I put mine in an order. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean... The, okay. Let's just roll. So I did the last one. Do you want to start start with that? Sure. Yeah, I'll go with my number 10. Uh, and this is one that I didn't even know about until you sent me the list of, of the stuff coming out next year. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that, by the way. And yeah. this is one called The Black Demon. Now, I don't know if this is intended to be a, a theatrical release or if it's just going to be a streaming release. But I had never heard of it. And <laughs> when you hear of what it is, maybe you'll know why I want to watch it. But it's apparently about an oil rig out in the ocean that is attacked by a monstrous shark uh a monstrous black shark which it turns out is supposed to be a megalodon mm -hmm. and uh and that's it they have to survive it's going to be like a, a disaster movie except it's uh it's an oil rig and it's being uh, attacked by a giant shark so that's kind of all i need in order to, to put it on my list i'm i'm a huge shark fan and you'll see so uh, even later in my list as well. But yeah, I I am very on board for any Megalodon movie that someone's willing to put some budget into. There have been plenty with very little budget, and those are, you know, uh, what we call asylum pictures. Uh, but, uh, but I don't believe that's what this is, so I'm putting it on my list at number 10. Number 10 because I'm not sure. So we'll see yeah. what happens with it. Yeah, it's, it's one of those where I, I like Josh Lucas, but the fact that we have another... Big shark movie coming later this year. I, I mean, the only thing I guess would be that they're putting it out theatrical, so maybe there's some, some hope it's okay enough. But <laughs> okay, man. So my number ten is the son of a legend, and yet uh, his second film I wasn't quite oh, as into. I know yeah, what you're so going this for. is yeah, this is the Brandon Cronenberg film Infinity Pool, and so we have Alexander Skarsgård, we have Mia Goth, who is fresh off of you know just making major waves last year with her dual performance in both Pearl and X. And yeah, it's va vacationing, higher society, being pushed into doing like brutal, disgustipated sort of things. It, it's really more so than anything, the fact that, you know, being uh, obviously, you know, the son of Cronenberg and everything is just, it, it holds a lot of weight for, for Brandon. And uh you know, even if I didn't like Possessor that much, I thought uh, Antiviral was pretty damn exceptional. And he still, I, I mean, from a visualistic standpoint, I thought Possessor was pretty awesome. So even though the trailers didn't wow me, this is one, like with a few others on my list, I'm going based on the, the pedigree of, of the person, probably. So there you go. It's coming out in just a... Just like a week or two, uh, January 27th, so Infinity Pool. Yeah, I watched Possessor. I wasn't a big fan, so I'm not incredibly excited about it. I'll wait and, and hear what people say, but... Uh, that's going to bring us to my number nine, which is one that I wasn't even aware of until like this crazy buzz it's been getting the last like month, month and a half. And it's a movie that, if I'm not mistaken, the lore was released on YouTube and got some some buzz. And now Shudder has picked it up for release. And it's called Skinamarink. Mm. And uh, I I don't know anything about this. I know some people have watched and reviewed it already. Uh, maybe they. That. Yeah, maybe they reviewed the, uh, the the YouTube version or something, but apparently it did well enough where Shudder picked it up. It's a low-budget horror movie, and one can only assume it has to do with, you know, the old tune, Skinnamarinky-dinky-dink, Skinnamarinky-doo, I'm gonna kill you, but those aren't the actual words. Uh, but yeah, that so interesting, interesting title. You know, it uh, makes me curious. I have not watched any trailers for it or anything. I just kind of would rather go in 
knowing the little bit that I know now and, and see how it washes over me. But the buzz it's been getting has me intrigued. So yeah, I'll, I'll put Skinamarink as my numero nueve. Nice, nice. Yeah, this as of this filming, I believe this comes to limited theaters this weekend. And oh. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think Spooky is one of the few that I had seen put a review yeah. up already. So, okay, coolness, man. Yeah, I'm not, it's one that I'm curious about for sure. Um, the next one is another where it's going to be going off of pedigree, but this guy is one for one, okay? In a similar vein to how Robert Eggers was champion as being one of the new voices of horror. Well, Ari Aster was the other one. Uh. And her Hereditary blew us the hell away, man. And then I was very underwhelmed with Midsommar. It was mm -hmm. too much retread for me. But uh, his third film with Joaquin Phoenix, I have yet to watch the trailer, which I believe just hit as of yesterday. I was going to put it in our like roundup, this. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I haven't watched it yet. But just based on the fact that it's supposed to be psychological horror, dark comedy craziness. I mean, Joaquin Phoenix always brings it. Some of the images I've seen about a disturbed child and aging into uh, just, you know, his later years and still trying to wrap his head around a certain sort of mystery. I, I believe it's related to a disappearance of a family member or something that everybody who I have seen putting blurbs out about the trailer, uh, shout out to Sinister Cinema and Jason to say they think it looks bonkers. And so uh, I'm going to be hopeful that it, just going somewhere a little more comedic, because I think there was some unintentionally comedic aspects about Midsommar. But if this is him going full on horror comedy crazy and I'm, I'm all for seeing where, where Ari Aster goes with it so uh Bo is afraid being the title of this film uh coming out later this year cool uh all right and uh that's gonna bring me to my number eight and the next two are gonna be kind of the more uh family horror side of things so this one again it's it's anticipated to come out this year yeah I'll put it at number eight uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife 2 Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is going to be not helmed by Jason Reitman this time, but helmed by the person that was working closely with him on that first Ghostbusters Afterlife film uh, with actors from that first film returning. And I'm just hoping that it's not going to be, you know, a lot of uh, let's just let's just say this. I hope they don't fucking bring back Vigo for this one, because they, the, the first Ghostbusters Afterlife, while I liked it was basically just a lot of the first Ghostbusters movie, you know, re reshuffled. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I wasn't the, you know, with the dogs and, and, uh, you know, uh, the Zool, you know, I, I, it was like, okay, like I like what we're doing, but it's so much of the first movie that I don't, I don't know. So as long as Vigo isn't the center of this second Ghostbusters Afterlife movie, I'm excited to see what they do with the franchise now. Like this, to me, should be the first venture into new territory because, you know, we know Ghostbusters 1 and 2. We know the 2016 Ghostbusters wasn't uh, tremendous, but didn't do really anything new either. Uh, and then Ghostbusters Afterlife was just Ghostbusters 1, uh, the, the, the young adult version. And, mm. uh, and so this should be an attempt at something fucking new with the characters that have been established. Like, that's what I'm hoping. So, um, my concern about that is probably what's keeping it a little lower on my list, but I do have, uh, I guess, high hopes for it. Yeah. I, I wasn't as high on afterlife as a lot of other people, and especially the third act. It was too much retread for me. And this is another one that I'm I'm really curious if they're going to hit that December release date that they have staked their their claim to. But um, obviously, being a big fan of the franchise, I just bought that Spirits Unleashed game because it's on sale right now on Xbox. So love the franchise, and I'm not gonna not gonna bat an eye. So okay, so uh, this would be us down to number eight now for me. Mm -hmm. And this is one that still doesn't have a official release date yet, but at, they're saying summer. 2023 for hulu and that is the newest adaptation of stephen king's the boogeyman and Ooh. i've seen a lot of people that most notably in my hail to stephen king facebook group being like oh it's pg-13 it's gonna suck whatever keep in mind pg-13 horror as we saw recently with megan and as we've seen with everything from mama to you know the insidious films like you can really push it far with pg-13 with horror you don't have to have f-bombs and like grisly gore for something like this to be effective and it's from the Night Shift collection, if I remember correctly, and it's the old, hey, there's something in the closet, and it was responsible for the death of my son, 
And uh, it is feature length, obviously, but it's really the talent associated with this that has me even more hopeful. I know you didn't like dash cam, but no. host was fantastic. And the fact that this is Rob Savage, that director's first time venturing away from the found footage genre has me intrigued. And then he's got a stellar cast, Sophie Thatcher, who was one of the standouts from the first season of Yellow Jackets. You also have David Desmalchian, who anything he's in, he always brings an entertaining sort of supplemental sort of presence and stuff. Uh, uh, Marin Ireland is in this too, if I remember correctly. So yeah, PG-13, whatever. It's it's a confirmed Stephen King adaptation uh, coming this summer on Hulu. So uh, yeah, bring it on. Let's, let's hope it's better than Chernobyl Diaries, which was <laughs> the first non found footage outing of the paranormal activity director uh, uh, so that's that's the relationship there um mm. so that's going to go to my number seven then and my number seven is going to be the other family horror on the list and some people might not understand why i'm putting it there but i'm talking about the new haunted mansion movie coming from disney uh, yeah. so i have high hopes for this because i think people and the studios are either starting to wisen up or starting to be replaced by the people like us <laughs> who actually have good ideas for, for reboots and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, the uh, So I think that it's not going to be a silly thing like the Eddie Murphy one was. I think it'll be closer. And in fact, the the, the breakdown of it does sound closer to the, the story where it's a family moves in to a haunted mansion, which that I think that probably was the Eddie Murphy one too. But there's a lot more talent, I think, in my opinion, associated with this one. You've got Jamie Lee Curtis, Jared Leto, Winona Ryder, Owen Wilson, Danny DeVito, Lakeith Stanfield, Rosario Dawson, T Tiffany Haddish. So there's like a ton of great names that I don't <coughs> think would jump on bullshit, at least at this point in their careers. So um, although, you know, Jamie Lee just did the Halloween ends and kills. But, you know, besides that. Um, I am excited to to see what this might bring. It might be another disaster, but I, again, have, have hopes for this. Yeah, this one intrigues me because you've got some very comedic-centric actors, but also the ones that are of the more serious variety or have versatility like Lakeith mm -hmm. and, uh, and Jared. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued as well for this one. So, Q, Q. All right, man. So my number seven is uh, going to be jumping into, I guess, a bit of the potentially comedic. Well, if... I saw the trailer, so it's going full comedic, which I wasn't 100% was going to be the case. But it's it's Renfield. Mm. It's the it's the Nick Cage. Nick you Lipple. saw the trailer? It, it played before Megan, so. Oh, you can't close your eyes. I I walked in in the middle of it. I saw maybe half of it, so I at least had the tone thrown at me. I walked back out, admittedly, of the theater. I didn't stand and check out the whole damn thing, Terrible. but I at least got. I saw enough of a little bit of a scene to be like, <laughs> okay, this is probably the tone that they're going to go for. So I haven't seen the whole damn thing, but uh, it, it appears that it's going pretty comedic. And who knows? Maybe they will have a nice balance of horror. They'll go more Fright Night with it or something, which could be exciting. But uh, just, I, I mean, those two alone, you know, uh, Nick Cage, when he does decide to ham it up, uh, when he gets all cagey and whatnot, um, and then Nicholas Holt as... It's even in the uh, just description of it, the fact that it's about the, the familiar. So I don't know how informed by what we do in the shadows this is going to be. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the little snippet that I saw looked very promising. I, I had seen some people before the trailer dropped really crapping on this movie. They're like, oh, it's going to be another one of those cage projects that's terrible. But I don't know. I have hopes for it. So and, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing the full glimpse of it. Fair enough. Yeah. So my number six is now we're going to be starting to get into the bigger stuff uh, for me. And so my number six is going to be the new Exorcist movie that we're supposed to be getting. Um, obviously, it's a classic franchise. I was a fan of the two season series that we got, which ended up being a sequel to the original movie. Uh, I, I, I like the brand of the Exorcist. I mean, possession movies are kind of a dime a dozen nowadays, but if it's got the brand on there of The Exorcist, then it gives me hope that it's not going to be a complete waste of my time. It's a pretty strong series when you consider one uh, is the classic, two brings Reagan back, three is apparently a lot of people's like uh, 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 quiet favorite. I love three, dude. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Good. And then creepy as hell. the Dominion one, I've only watched once, so I need to, to give it another look. But, you know, it's a strong series, and so it's got a pedigree 
that gives me hope. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of my list here is is down to hoping it's going to be good because there's there's no accounting for what actually comes out of the studios nowadays. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I am I'm excited for what the Exorcist may be, especially considering those involved. Yeah, it was a contender to get on my list, but the reason it didn't is because this is David Gordon Green and uh, right. Yeah, doing after how some people felt about ends and kills and whatnot. I, I don't know. It's 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 going to be interesting to see what he does with another franchise. Mm -hmm. So, okay, cool. So uh, coming up for me is going to be we talked about him in our previous video, M Night Shyamalan, his newest film, Knock at the Door, which comes out here. Knock at the cabin. Couple. Knock at the cabin. I said Knock at the door. Derp Fuego. <laughs> Knock at the cabin. Uh, so this more so than anything. Uh, I've seen a lot of people put praise uh, for the book that he is adapting here. Now, granted, a lot of people did not like Old was the one where they were on the beach, that mm -hmm. his, his previous feature film, and I didn't mind that one as much. It was as, terrible, as, shut as up. You and, yeah, I know, I know, you and Marcia couldn't stand it. But um, just the, the trait, I did not watch the second trailer specifically because I've heard it, it spoils a lot of stuff. But the first one, Dave Batista in this serious role of ominousness I, I was really about uh the the small actress who's uh, the young actress who's playing the daughter she looks like she is going to have an interesting dynamic of being this catalyst for something major that could be earth ending or earth saving and so that whole paradigm always kind of fascinates me and uh, m night hey even his weaker stuff i still except for last airbender i guess but you know just about everything else even the lady in the water i found some merits for here and there and well i guess the happening not so much but still i i watch everything that he puts out because he is one of those auteurs that just anytime he puts something out it is kind of an event for for genre fans and so yeah it's one that i could have seen a few months ago i think was when there was like some sort of test screening that they were doing i think that's the one monty went to but i decided to sit it out and and we can we can hopefully see it together or at least sometime shortly before it arrives so that's my number five that's my next one so oh, i'll just cool. i'll just piggyback on there and say yeah i mean i watch everything Shyamalan too some obviously better than others but he's always an entertaining watch the first time through so i am excited about it and i he i've seen interviews where he says that batista is you know the best he's ever been in this and batista's already started to prove himself to me as like a legitimate actor even more so than the rock like because the rock like has to have projects built around him mm -hmm. i think batista realizes that he wants to be a a pivotal cog in the wheel rather than the one driving the car um mm -hmm. which is important you know for because he does that means he doesn't have to be the star every time and and never lose a fight contractually and um, all that stuff. The only thing I know that he has in, a, in his contract, because I saw a TikTok about it earlier today, is that he's contractually obligated to eat every four hours in order to maintain his mass. So he has to take wow. a break in uh, every four hours to, to have a meal real quick. Yeah, to eat like two pounds of chicken. Or something. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, more power to him. But yeah, he, he's been great. And a lot of stuff, he actually even brought out some emotion in one of his recent ones. I can't remember what it was. Um, he was good in a small role in Blade Runner 2049. See, I didn't see that. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I can't think of what it is. Obviously, Drax, he's amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, but he, he, I thought, had a... Wasn't he in the Zack Snyder zombie movie, too? Yeah, he was. Yeah, I thought he was good in that as well. Yeah, uh, that. yeah so he's just an entertaining actor, and he's got... He's got charm, but he, he has an obvious depth that he's he's starting to mine, and I'm excited to see where it goes, and I think this is uh, going to be an opportunity for him to do so, and the Shyamalan of it all is just, you know, uh, it's it's the foundational cake that he can be the frosting on top of, hopefully, so. Yeah, hell yeah. So yeah, that's my number five, Knock at the Cabin as well. Sweet, sweet. Okay, so the first overlap, which is good, good, good. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so my number... So this would be my number five. Your five, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, so I guess I'm going to have to go with it because of the sheer absurdity of the premise, and uh, that would be Elizabeth Banks' Cocaine Bear. Oh, and, okay. And it, it looks so bonkers, and I'm hoping it is as bloody and ridiculous and over the top as the trailers have made it out to be. Uh, you've got a, a stellar cast, which includes the final role from uh, none other than uh, Ray Liotta, which is kind of a kind of a bummer, unfortunately. But which is why I hope the film is actually you know good and sends him up properly, as opposed to just being some some bit of silliness. But yeah, the whole based on true events bit of all of this. Uh, apparently, there was some bear that did 
mm -hmm. come upon some cocaine and uh, you know at least died 45 minutes later. Yeah, yeah, probably. No, it did, literally. Oh, oh it did? Okay. Yeah. So, but, I mean, Kerry Russell, O'Shea Jackson Jr., which is Ice Cube's kid, who has really come into his own, both on the comedic and the dramatic side, I think. It's, so, yeah, I, I just hope it's gory and vulgar and silly, and that's what some of my favorite horror films always epitomize. So, there you go. Cocaine. It, yeah. it looks like it's going to be the right kind of silly. But let me say, even though it's his last performance, if they miss an opportunity for someone to flush cocaine down the toilet and have him yell Karen at them, then what are we even doing with this world? You know what I mean? Right. I, I would hope Elizabeth Banks with all of her, you know. She has to be named Karen though. He has to be uh, like, Karen, come on, why Karen, why? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful for that. My number four that was originally here is going to move up for a reason. And uh, I will reveal that reason lest I reveal what it is uh, by telling you the reason now. So my number four is instead going to be my previous number three, which also looks like it might be not as silly, but still kind of you got to buy into the silliness of the premise. Uh, and it's going to be 65. I'm very excited to see uh, Adam Driver go up against dinosaurs on a, on a crazy foreign planet. Like, that just seems like a, a silliness. It seems like a Turok movie mixed with yeah. the Outlander movie that I love so much with J Jim Caviezel, where he's a, yeah, a space guy that crashes with a creature in Viking times and has to help take it down. Um, this is, it looks like Adam Driver crash lands on a crazy planet um, during prehistoric times and has to survive with futuristic guns. Again, a very Turok premise when we've never seen a live-action Turok movie. I know they were trying to make one at one point. Um, yeah, I mean, he would need to be Native American, obviously, for it to be uh, correct. Oh, yeah. But but it does feel fun, and the effects look like they put the budget in. Like It, it seems like even non-Jurassic Park movies can start to have Jurassic Park-level dinosaurs in them, so that's great. And it'll sell the movie, and uh, based on the trailer that I saw that we reacted to, I am very excited about 65. So yeah, that's my silly number three. Or number four, rather. Number four, I thought. Yeah, yep, yeah. Yep. Sweet. Cool, cool. Yeah, it, it's definitely one that I'm, I'm curious about. Uh, it, it's the fact that it's been delayed over and over and over, and I would imagine that had probably something to do with the pandemic. But I think Sam Raimi actually co-produced it or like had, had some sort of involvement with it, which is exciting. So, and coolness, man. Well, my number four, I actually just I added to this list because it was either one that I had forgotten about or maybe they properly dated it, but... It is called Last Voyage of the Demeter. Oh, another and, Dracula. <laughs> yeah, another Dracula, but this is the serious one. And this right. is uh, uh, directed by Andre Ovradal, who mm. did uh, the Troll Hunter movie, Autopsy mm -hmm. of Jane Doe, mm -hmm. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. I didn't love his previous film as much as I was expecting to. It was called Mortal, and it had... Oh, it had not the wolf kid who was in Hereditary, his brother, who's also an actor. Anyway, um, solid, but it was more of the like superhero-centric with some Norwegian mythology associated, but wasn't terrific, unfortunately. But this has a really cool cast, David Desmalchen, once again, and uh, it, it, there's some conflicting reports about all of the actors, uh, you know, some bigger names that I'm not sure are actually involved anymore, or maybe there was recasting or whatever. But it's based on one particular chapter of Dracula, which is the captain's log that deals with uh, I, it's stuff I don't want to spoil necessarily. I'm curious how they're going to expand it into a full on feature, but it's been a passion project. What's well, the ship that carried him over? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, but, but that's where I'm like, how do you expand it into full on feature length? Is oh God, that'd be, that'd be, uh, you could absolutely make that a thriller. Cause it's only, cause it's only one chapter, the captain's log. No, I, I know, but a thriller on the high seas as people slowly start to discover people are dying and why yeah. and how and drained of blood and, Oh, yeah. there's, there's, there's so much in that. I could totally see that being a full length feature. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, but uh, Andre Overdahl from a stylistic standpoint has always brought it. Autopsy of Jane Doe is probably one of my favorite horror films of the last like decade or so. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that he's going back into the full on horror genre. And it's one that honestly, if, if there weren't so many bigger, heavy hitting franchise sort of films that are going to be in my top three, this probably would have been a lot higher up. So gotcha. Okay. So that's going to bring me to my number three, which again, I'm shifting down one because I moved my four up a couple. Uh, this is going to be the Meg 2. 
Uh, yeah, I I know the first one was was silly and not super great, especially lacking in the <laughs> for a giant megalodon movie. It, it kind of lacked bite. You know what I mean? <laughs> so um, it 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 was originally going to be made by Eli Roth, and I think that would have been much more <clears throat> up my alley. But Absolutely. they still did a, a good job with it. It's still. Like, if I happen to cross, I mean, it doesn't really happen that you, you know, I'm flipping through channels on TV anymore. You kind of have to seek things out to watch them nowadays on streaming. But um, were it to come on or were someone else to be watching it when I walked in the room, it's not hard for me to just sit and enjoy. Uh, because it is a, a very much a popcorn giant shark movie. Now, I think and hope that they learned from certain mistakes that were made in that film and are able to course correct and make it a bit scarier for the second one. But more giant sharks are more giant sharks. And this one, if it's, it is called Meg to the Trench. So it, it has the second book feel because the second Meg book was called The Trench. Mm -hmm. And it dealt with, you know, a, a scientific uh, lab down basically in the Mariana Trench. Uh, and, uh, and they introduce another prehistoric creature called the Chronosaur, um, which is a, basically a prehistoric alligator that mm. starts to uh, come into the fold as well. So if they do that, it means they're starting down the path that Steve Alton did with the books, where he eventually brings all the, like all, all aquatic dinosaurs end up still existing in a hidden, uh, a hidden part of the ocean and stuff like that. So I, if we can get there, then I'm all on board to, to watch more and more mag movies. I, I don't think there's any way it's not going to make its money because to me, it's like a Marvel superhero movie. A giant shark is a shoe in at the box office. I mean, look at the first movie. It wasn't great, but people just went in droves and it made tons of money. So I'm, I'm excited for Meg too. I just, again, I have hopes. I don't know that it'll be great, but I have hopes. Yeah, I'm trying to remember who they actually swapped out directors for because I don't think Turtle Tob is. No, it's not Turtle Tob this time. This no, it's actually, I think it was someone it's, that. Uh, it looks like it's Ben Wheatley. Actually. Yeah, and he's yeah. done some good stuff. Didn't he do. What did he do? He's done. Uh, he did High Rise. He did Free Fire. He right. Did the Earth last year, which I. Well, last year being 2021 when it was released. But mm -hmm. so he's he's a little less of the. Like, didn't Turtle Tob do like the National Treasure? Yeah, stuff? yeah. So, like, he's a big he's, budget boy. Yeah, yeah. This this is a more interesting choice, in my opinion, because of the fact that he has a more sophisticated horror sort of experience. Right. But um, I, hey, I'll I will gladly go see it with you. I love <laughs> love the first book. I, I maybe it's about time to check out some of the sequels now with this, you know, finally coming out. Uh, Might as well. Like some of the sequel novels being those. Yeah, you know? at least also, at least Alden read the trench. A, yeah, and also Alden was such a great interview when I got yeah. to sit in with you on that. Man. Yeah, I've interviewed him twice on the channel. Yeah, he was really cool. So, okay, sweet. So, my next one is it's another one of those theoretical Stephen Kings. And the only reason <laughs> I, I thought about not putting it in, but yet it's listed on, they recently updated the IMDb, it says 2023. And then also uh, they uh, there is a new paperback version of Salem's Lot that is listed on Amazon and they're like, you know, releasing in theaters 2023. So they're still, even though they've shifted it twice from last year and it doesn't have a set release date yet, they're, they're still claiming 2023. And God, I hope so, because even though I'm not like over the moon excited about this film, I'm trying to be hopeful because Bill Pullman's kid, Lewis Pullman, who was in Bad Times at the El Royale, he was in a smaller role in the most recent Top Gun film. He is our new uh, Ben Mears, I believe the name of the author is from, from Salem Slot. And even though I'm not the biggest Gary Doberman fan either, uh, he he didn't do an awful job with it in, in chapter two as far as scripting and stuff goes. He's directing this one now. Granted, he directed The Nun, and there's a sequel to that coming this year that I most definitely did not want to put on our list. So I don't know. Salem's Lot is like top tier king in my estimation. It's in my top five of all of his books. And uh, the fact that it's the first time we're going to be seeing it theatrically, as opposed to the two previous adaptations being on television, one with Toby Hooper in 79, which was great. And then the one in the 2000s with Rob Lowe was pretty bad. So I don't know. The fact that it's theatrical, the fact that it's R, uh, my only reservations really being the fact that it's been delayed over and over. But I'm thinking that might have more to do with the power shifting going on at Warner Brothers and the Discovery merger and all that different stuff. Although they've been 
pulling and messing with stuff because they thought it was of lesser quality from what I understand. So I don't know. Um, you know, I love my fangers. So this is one that I'll definitely be checking out and especially being the big fan of El Rey like I am. So Salem's Lot, that's at the number three. Fingers firmly crossed. It does come out in 23, like all indications seem to keep you pointing to. So Fair enough. So my number two is going to be what moved up my list. And the reason it moved up my list is because Robert and I did a trailer reaction for it, and I was very excited about it after seeing the trailer. And that's going to be Evil Dead Rise. Mm -hmm. I am a big fan of the Evil Dead franchise, obviously, like most horror fans. Uh, but I was, again, I was in on it when I was a kid, when they first came out, and Evil Dead 2 was something that producer Dave and I uh, really bonded over early on and then army of darkness in a whole different way for the comedy aspect yeah. and then we as a show were very much on top of ash versus evil dead the first two seasons um, we liked the the 2013 remake and uh, i actually just ordered the unrated version so i can finally watch it for the coverage we plan to do uh and then uh this trailer looks great. It's it's you know Evil Dead in a, in an apartment building, but there's still aspects of you know a cabin involved. And how does the Necronomicon make its way up there? And what happens when it uh, starts to turn a, a particular member of a family in the apartment complex? And it looks great. The trailer was was very effective. The Deadite woman that we see at least is is very uh, unnerving and scary and has some great lines like uh your mother's with the maggots now like i was yeah. like oh so fucking good and uh and i'm just very excited it was it was a wonderful trailer that really got uh got my blood pumping and, and i didn't know if that was going to happen you know that i i'm not averse to you know uh, high rise horror uh believe it or not Pol uh, poltergeist 3 is one of my favorites that takes mm. place in the apartment building and there's the uh the puddle that someone gets pulled down into that is forever one of the reasons why i'm scared of puddle puddles <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean i i i'm very uh very optimistic about this especially after watching the trailer for evil dead rise so that's my number two that was a damn good trailer um what didn't put it in contention for me is that i'm still wondering how evil dead it's actually going to be now granted yes there's a necronomicon and so on but what teeth a, but but a bit of criticism that i saw from one person who I, i'm not going to name them call them out or anything but i i do respect their horror opinion a lot and he was like okay it's an awesome looking trailer but it does despite its effectiveness it doesn't feel as evil dead i guess more on the generic side of ferocity i solid, completely disagree but... solid, solid execution uh, and, and there's some very effective bits in that trailer it looks a lot scarier and going scary isn't my issue because the the remake i thought that fetty alvarez did was was terrific um so yeah it looks it looks like a great horror movie it just makes me wonder how great of an evil dead movie it could be and i still i, I don't understand that statement I have trouble disassociating with Bruce, and I know that's something that Robert had said a number of times leading up to the Rise trailer. I'm guessing the Rise trailer won him over. So. Oh yeah, it did. Uh, okay. I don't understand. How does it not feel Evil Dead? Because it's not at a cabin? Like, the Necronomicon, the Deadite, the, the Deadite like being held in a different part of somewhere? Like, that's all very Evil Dead. I don't understand. I know, but there's been other stuff with, you know, Books of the Dead, and there's so many possession movies, and, you know, with creepiness and uh, evil dead was a possession movie and there it were was, possession I, movies way before it i still feel like that franchise really for me at least that franchise solidified itself with the humor that's just personal opinion and that is the that's the evil dead that i've always preferred is two darkness and the series compared to but the you just said you liked the the remake which was no not not humorous not humorous at all i like the remake and i i think i'm gonna i don't doubt that i'm gonna like rise but i feel like i'm gonna like it for the same reasons that i did the remake was the brutality and not necessarily but i'm saying did the remake not feel like evil dead not it, it very much felt like a remake that was trying to be gorier and crazier so I mean, okay yeah so anyway <laughs> so it's not that it doesn't feel like evil dead it doesn't feel like your preferred evil dead except that's that's probably the better way of summarizing it okay yeah, okay exactly. okay so, yeah. um yeah, because there's there's tons of Evil Dead elements all over it, but yeah, but I I, I hear what you're saying if that's if yeah. that's what you're going for. Okay. So my number one is yeah. oh I still had my my two oh I'm sorry oh yeah. you were talking about my number two still <laughs> my bad yeah. my bad I thought I thought for a second you were agreeing with it but okay yep yeah. go for it 
so so my number two is also another one that they say is coming in 2023 but it doesn't have the official date but we do have the teaser that ty west put out and that is maxine that is mia goth yeah, how could it name. not come out this year yeah I, I mean with the quick turnaround that he had with pearl coming out the same damn year which just shocked me mm -hmm. but um, yeah, we have that little teaser where we see the the triple X Maxine, you know, and the the, the Hollywood letters and everything. Uh, he impressed me so goddamn much with both of those films and the fact that they were, from a stylistic standpoint, so drastically different and distinctive, which I which I appreciated. Mia Goth has, I I would say, established herself as a powerhouse like leading lady now, as opposed to doing these more supporting roles like you know. Um, uh, Cure for Wellness and some of the other stuff that I'd Ugh. seen previously. So I'm very excited for this. I, I, the fact that it is another of these 80s throwbacks, which were popularized so much with Stranger Things, which we talked about in our last video for the you know, best TV of the year and stuff. I'm, I'm curious how Ty West is going to approach that sort of era. And I honestly have a lot of faith in him because he impressed me so very much with both of his films last year. And I... I think that there is now the burden of expectation, and he seems very capable of delivering, at least for me. So that is my number two, is Maxine. Cool. Yeah, I, I had forgotten about that, but I, I would be excited about that, too. Um, that that might have pushed the Black Demon off my list if I had thought about it. So, um, so yeah, good good choice. Uh, not my number one, though. My number one is one that we're not sure it if it's going to come out this year, but I am oh. hopeful. Like, there's not a date for it, but... What we do know is that A, casting has been done, and B, production is supposed to start in February. When production starts in February, usually production on a film lasts two to three months at the most, at the, at the higher end of it. And then there's post-production. The movie is being made by Blumhouse, who tends to not take a long time with that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. uh, so I am very hopeful that we are going to get a Five Nights at Freddy's movie finally this year. Uh, this is something that Blumhouse has had access to and has been supposedly working on for many years now. It is the number one thing that Jason Blum is tweeted about. He has mentioned it on a number of occasions. He makes jokes about it like, man, if, if you FNAF people would just like something else as much as you like FNAF, I'd be in good shape. You know, that oh, kind of FNAF. thing. <laughs> yeah, FNAF. 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 Yeah, that, uh, sorry. That's, that's what, yeah, that's what we gamers call Five Nights at Freddy's. It's FNAF. Um, but, uh, but basically I am very excited. The casting that they announced is that, uh, Matthew Lillard oh, and yeah, Josh right. Hutchinson, yeah. Hutchinson are now involved and it was revealed who they are, which is exciting. So Josh Hutchinson is the security guard, um, who, who goes to, to manage the pizza place, uh, presumably over the course of the five nights. Um, uh, that's what the game is. If you don't know, you basically play a security guard hired to, uh, watch over a pizza restaurant over the course of five nights and every night get, uh, gets harder and harder because the animatronics get more and more active and more and more murderous towards you. Um, so I don't know if they'll stick to the five nights aspect of the story, which, you know, it's kind of in the title. <coughs> so it'd be tough not to, but, but yeah, Matthew Lillard is apparently, and I, when I first found out this news, I tweeted, if Matthew Lillard doesn't play William Afton, then it's a tremendously missed opportunity because he could bring some crazy energy to that role. And it mm -hmm. turns out that Matthew Lillard is playing William Afton. Nice. So I'm very excited about that. William Afton is the one that created the animatronics after he loses a child um, and he's a little bit crazy and the animatronics start killing children. And then, you know, in the continuity, the children's spirits become very angry and possess the animatronics and start, um, being very bad themselves. So it's, it's a really cool lore. It's a very convoluted lore because there've been literally like eight or nine games at this point. Um, so it's gotten all twisty and turny, but but the core of it with William Afton, his son, Michael, his partner, uh, Emily, uh, Henry Emily, um, all of that is really wonderful ground to mine if they do it correctly. And if Blumhouse doesn't Blumhouse this up and actually <laughs> sticks with a good writer, because he's starting to be able to do that. You know, Jason Blum is starting to make better decisions about his original horror, Megan being a very recent uh, example of it. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited 
for what this could be. Now, it is possible that it's not going to arrive this year, but I think if they're filming starting in February, they're going to push it to be done by the end of the year, especially considering he knows how much, how hotly anticipated it is uh, by the fans, which is a, a very, very high number of people at this point. So, yeah, um, if it doesn't come out, uh, I would just go with The Last of Us TV show as my number one, even though it's not a movie. So, <laughs> Nice, man. Okay, cool, cool. Well, yeah, that's a film that I'm incredibly excited about. You know, Even though I don't know, I haven't played any of the games, but I've seen not just your fervor for them, but various others, and the concept seems right up my alley, even if Willy's Wonderland seems like it kind of ripped it up just a wee bit. But... It was the Wish version. Yeah, but Matt Lillard, I mean, he has shown, I, I don't know if this would be full on goofy or if it no. would have some dramatic sort of element. Absolutely. He loses because, a child. Yeah, 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 because Lillard showed, I mean, the scene with him crying at the end of SLC Punk Dude showed that that guy has chops. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine they are still in there, even if he's, you know, doing more like Scooby Doo and voiceover and whatever sort of stuff. Yeah, he can hit drama heavily and I would love to see it again. So, okay, so my number one. And this is one that I'm kind of surprised that I'm actually saying, because if you had asked me either before or even after the release of Spiral, I don't necessarily know if I would have said Saw X. Oh, but wow. As your number yeah, one. That's my number one, dude. And that's because... Oh, you really liked them when you finally watched them. Oh, yes, I did. And I bonded with Jason Smith. Shout out to Sinister Cinema, man. And the fact that this is both of our number one for this year, especially for the sheer fact that they're bringing back Tobin Bell. It's going to be very much a John Kramer-centric story. Possibly uh, bringing back uh, Shawnee the Smith. girl. Yeah, Shawnee. Yeah, Shawnee Smith. And that, you also have uh, Kevin Grufert. I'm sorry, I had his name pulled up. But uh, he was the one who directed my favorite installment aside from the original trilogy, which is Saw 6, which was one of the few Saws that actually had something serious about society to say in its indictment of modern medicine and insurance companies and stuff like that the final chapter eh, not so much which that's the one crap. with the shotgun wheel right uh number six i oh boy there's so many goddamn traps in this but i mean yeah. six is the one that I, I remember very distinctively because of the fact that it was about the terminal nature of kramer's uh, you know uh, medical problems right. and stuff and just you know him going with the insurance company and the guy who becomes the the one who is tormented and tortured and everything so that that is my favorite aside from the first trilogy. He is the one who is returning to direct. And, uh, you know, I didn't mind Jigsaw that much, but, you know, Spiral I thought was pretty weak, unfortunately, and just couldn't figure out its tone very well. But, yeah, the, the Saw franchise, upon watching them all in succession, uh, what, a year or so ago, whenever the, the one with... Uh, uh, SNL dude was was coming out um, Chris Rock I I gained a new appreciation for the series and for the intertwinements of everything and so yeah it's uh, sorry guys it's not Scream 6 it's Saw 10 as far as big genre big franchise sequels go the fact that you of everything you refer to Chris Rock as the SNL guy when he was on it like one season <laughs> for longer than that was he? I don't know like a couple seasons definitely yeah. not I mean, David Spade would be the SNL guy I mean anybody who started at SNL I will probably refer to them as SNL people. you okay. know Bill Murray the SNL I'm guy. sure they'd love that yeah. um, <laughs> all right guys so that's gonna do it for our top 10 most anticipated horror of 2023 did we miss anything? Did we forget anything? I'm sure that's possible. Let us know in the comments down below if so. And uh, let us know what your thoughts are on our on our picks, if you, if you have any particular thoughts on that. Be very curious to know what those are. Thank you to our patrons for supporting the channel the way that you do. We greatly, greatly appreciate it, and it makes all the difference for us. So thank you very much. Until next time, though, I've been Cecil Laird. And gracias. I've been Jaime and Fuego. And remember, stay, stay scared. scared.